I'm working on the next edition of the Hells Angels newsletter. No, not for those guys on motorcycles. The 303rd bomb group was known as Hells Angels during World War II. We flew B-17 Flying Fortress bombers against targets in Nazi Germany and in occupied Europe. I've been editor of our Veterans Association newsletter for eight years. My name, Eddie Deerfield. No middle name, no middle initial. That really used to bother the personnel people in the Army and the U.S. Information Agency, where I spent many years of my professional career. They figured everyone had to have a middle name. And Eddie? No way. They kept trying to rename me Edward or Edwin or Eduardo. I think Eddie was my mother's idea. One of the most popular comedians when I was born in the year 1923 was a fellow named Eddie Cantor. I never thought I'd be around to see the 21st century. I was 82 on August the 24th of this year, 2005. I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, and raised in Chicago. My wife, Mary Lee, and I now live in retirement on the Gulf Coast. My father, Louis, emigrated from Russia to America in 1910 at the age of 22. It was during the reign of Tsar Nicholas II. He left to escape religious persecution or military prescription or both. He came from a town called Slawitz near Ravno in the Ukraine. His Russian name was Joseph Lapki Derfel, but he couldn't speak or write English, so at the port of entry into the U.S., his name was entered as Louis Deerfield. He applied for citizenship in 1914 and was naturalized as a citizen of the United States in 1920. My mother, Sadie, arrived from Poland and they were married in Omaha in 1921. My grandfather was Samuel Derfel and his wife was Lena. They never came to the U.S. and so, of course, I never met them. My father didn't have a profession. He described himself on his petition for citizenship as a laborer. The family moved from Omaha to Chicago in 1927, searching for better times. By then, I had a brother named Dan, two years younger than I, and a sister on the way to be named Marion. In Omaha, we were just about as poor as proverbial church mice and very little change in Chicago. My father worked for 10 years in a grain mill near the old Chicago stockyards. And then for another span, long span of years, selling fruit and vegetables from rented wagons pulled by horses that looked to me like they were ready for the glue factory. Yeah, somehow, my mother and father kept things going all through our poverty, although that poverty was always an embarrassment to me. We were loved by our parents, and I guess the pains of growing up could have been a lot worse. Before I was 13, I wrote and published a four-page newspaper sold for two cents in my neighborhood on the near northwest side of Chicago. I wrote poems and recited them at grammar school assemblies. I wrote essays, which often won prizes from organizations like the Illinois Humane Society. And then into my teens and attending Thule High School, I became a member of an acting company performing in the city and suburbs to raise money for various charities. Now, the downside was that in my junior and senior years in high school, 
I cut so many classes for performances that I barely graduated. I was ranked scholastically 417th in our graduating class of 500. Ah, but the upside was that I was elected class orator by my fellow students and also earned a letter as sports editor of the Thule Review. Plus, I was selected to serve as fire prevention chief of the city of Chicago during Boys Week and was invited by the sports editor of the Chicago Times to cover a baseball game between the Chicago Cubs and the Brooklyn Dodgers. And to me, that was a great honor. I also performed at the local Deborah Boys Club in such one-act plays as Telltale Heart, Nerves, Dress Reversal, and also appeared in a radio drama broadcast on a Chicago station, WCFL. I'm afraid I was never much of an athlete, except maybe for boxing. When I was 16, I won the welterweight championship match between boxers representing the Deborah Boys Club on the northwest side of Chicago and the American Boys Club on the west side of the city. We had an intense rivalry. The other guy was said to be their best fighter, but he wasn't able to handle my left jab. Anyway, after graduating, I got a job as a copy boy on the Chicago Daily Times in 1941, and I earned $16 a week. I love the work. But then came the Second World War. I enlisted as a private in July of 1942, just before I turned 19. I wanted the Army Air Corps. I felt that was best for me, and so I went by Greyhound bus from my home in Chicago to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, now that's just outside St. Louis, for basic training. My home for six weeks was a bunk bed on the second floor of a barracks building. Personnel had to decide what I would do in the Army Air Corps. Well, they must have figured he comes from Chicago, the gangster city, Al Capone, John Dillinger, the Mafia. So, I guess logically, they sent me to Aerial Gunnery School in Las Vegas, Nevada. They were sure that I could learn to shoot a 50 caliber machine gun in no time at all. Now, Las Vegas in those days was not a gambling town, just desert, stretching to the horizon. In the final week of gunnery training, we flew in an AT-6 single-engine aircraft and fired a machine gun at a target sleeve towed by another AT-6 about a hundred yards away. The bullet tips were freshly painted and different colors were assigned to each gunner. That way, when four or five gunners made firing passes on the same sleeve, the umpires on the ground could later tell who to credit when the sleeve was brought down. I did pretty well. 18 hits on the first day, 23 hits on the second day. Then after that, Salt Lake City, Utah, for radio operator training. And this was in January and February of 1943. We lived in converted stables on the fairgrounds. First time this city boy ever used an outhouse, and by golly, it was cold. And then, next change of station, Blythe, California, for crew training on a B-17 Flying Fortress bomber in blistering heat. There we lived in tents with rattlesnakes for company. Then, continuing crew training, next we went to Pio, Texas. Nice barracks, but as we stepped off the train, a supply clerk issued each of us a dust respirator. The dust was so thick, it reminded me of the fog that used to come in off Lake Michigan on humid summer mornings. Well, finally, May of 1943, we flew across the Atlantic in a B-17. We gave up the plane in Presswick, Scotland, 
and took a train to Molesworth in East Anglia, and that's in England, to join the 303rd Bomb Group. I was now a technical sergeant, a five-striper in the old Army Air Corps, assigned to a crew of ten men led by our pilot Robert Cogswell of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is a model of a B-17G. The major difference between the B-17F that we flew overseas was the addition of the chin turret right here with twin 50 caliber machine guns. Now the B-17 was slow and small compared to today's four engine bombers. But I'll tell you after 30 missions in combat that I flew, this aircraft was rugged and dependable against the enemy. It could take the worst kind of beating from enemy fighter planes and anti-aircraft ground fire and often survive. It was called a flying fortress because its armament included 13 50 caliber machine guns. Let me point out the positions. We have two in the nose turret, two more in the bombardiers and navigators section, two more in the top turret, two underneath in the ball turret, one in the radio room, and this incidentally was my gun position in the radio room, two 50 calibers in each side of the waist, and two 50 calibers in the tail. And here's what a uh, 50 caliber cartridge looks like. And remember, on the B-17 we had 13 machine guns firing these bullets. On combat missions, the bomb load on the B-17 was about 8,000 pounds. Cruising speed, about 180 miles an hour, and landing speed only 90 miles an hour. We bombed from about 20,000 feet at temperatures of 40 or 50 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Our clothing on a mission was multi-layered normal street clothing, then on top of that an electric heat suit, and finally fleece-lined leather jacket, pants, boots, cap, and gloves. And on top of all that, a parachute harness, inflatable life preserver, flak jacket, and steel helmet. Then, when we reached 10,000 feet, we put on oxygen masks. My first combat mission at the age of 19 was on July 10, 1943. We attacked a German fighter airfield near Paris. Five hours in the air, no American fighter escort in those days. British Spitfires stayed with us across the English Channel and a short way in while their fuel lasted. There was a lot of anti-aircraft fire and some German fighters. We picked up some flak holes in the fuselage. My position was in the radio room and that's right in the middle of the bomber between the wings. Then on our crew's sixth mission, July 30th of 1943, we were flying on a B-17 named Upstairs Maid. We crashed in the North Sea. We came down about 30 miles off the British coast and an equal distance from Belgium, which was occupied at that time by German troops. We had been hit hard by Messerschmitt 109s and Fulkwolf 190s on the way in and coming back from a raid on aircraft factories in Kassel, Germany. There was also damage to our bomber from heavy flak over the target. Bob Cogswell, our pilot, told the crew to prepare for ditching and ordered me to start sending SOS messages so British Air Sea Rescue could get a position fix on our plane. By the time we reached the North Sea, we had run out of fuel and we were a four-engine glider. When we hit the water, Bob managed to pancake the plane, which meant he used the tail section as a brake, 
and there were eight of us crammed into the radio room, and we all managed to climb into our dinghies, those are the inflatable rubber rafts, before the plane sank in little more than a minute. The pilot and co-pilot went out through the front of the plane. The remainder of us, the other eight, out through the top of the radio room hatch. Only the navigator was seriously hurt. Now as radio operator I was also the crew's medic and I remember taking a hypodermic needle from my first aid kit while we were in the raft which was bobbing around in the water. I cut open the navigator's trouser leg and gave him a shot of morphine in his thigh. The pilot of an American P-47 Thunderbolt fighter plane saw us go down and circled over us until a British air sea rescue boat picked us up before the Germans could f try to strafe our rafts. crews are saved by air sea rescue from the English Channel and the North Sea and return to combat service. Aside from human values, a trained fortress crew is even more valuable than the plane they man. And the work of the air sea rescue unit has been of enormous value to the 8th Air Force. I flew the famous, or maybe I should say infamous, August 17, 1943 mission to Schweinfurt. This was in Germany, and we were to hit ball-bearing factories. We were in a B-17 with a lovely lady painted on the nose. She wasn't wearing very much, and her first name was Isa. That's I-Z-A, and last name, Vailable. Yep, you got it, Isa Vailable. Well, an enemy fighter's 20 minute rocket exploded in our right wing. There were 30 caliber bullet holes in the engine cowling and flak holes in the wings. Here's an example of what we faced in the skies over Germany. It was filmed by the U.S. Army Air Corps. And Denmark has been penetrated to some distance without any great opposition as yet. So far there has been only some light and inaccurate flak at the coastline.
about uh, 200 B-17s of the 8th Air Force were sent over Germany that day. We bombed and managed to make it back to Molesworth, but 60 bombers never came back, most shot down by enemy fighters. That's 600 men lost on one mission. We had empty bunks in our Nissan hut that night. Seeing those empty bunks and knowing that men I had lived with were now either dead or prisoners of war was one of the worst nightmares of flying combat. Just 10 days later, Eyes Available was so badly shot up over Watton, France, a Nazi rocket installation, that we made a forced landing at the Manston Royal Air Force Base near the coast. On the ground, when we looked over the plane, we counted more than 200 flak holes in the fuselage, and yet not one of us on the crew was wounded. Interesting though, in the RAF non-commissioned officers mess that evening, a chamber music quartet played. Very dignified, very relaxing. Now that's a fringe benefit for sergeants that the U.S. Army Air Corps should have borrowed from the British. Then, on September the 26th of 1943, our target was the submarine pens at Nantes, France. About halfway there, the mission was recalled because of heavy cloud cover over the target. Soon after we turned for home, an engine on our B-17 named Lady Luck burst into flame off the south coast of England. We were at about 8,000 feet at that time over Southampton when pilot Cogswell ordered us to bail out. I was in radio contact with the pilot as five of us stood at the waist section door preparing to jump. Now, I know it sounds melodramatic, but I said to the pilot on intercom radio that we knew he could get us home and asked if we could stay with the plane. I'll never forget his response. He said, sure, you can stay with the plane. I'm bailing out. Well, I gave the crew a thumbs down signal, and one after another we jumped. We landed in trees, on rooftops, farmers' fields, near the towns of Old Olsford and Winchester. I came down backward and couldn't time my fall. I was stunned when I hit the ground, and when I came to, there was a farmer standing over me with a pitchfork against my chest. He had seen all these men jumping from a four-engine plane and thought we were German paratroopers invading England. Interesting footnote, I kept a small square of silk stamped with the name of my parachute manufacturer. It's amusing to think that my life was saved by the American Corset Company. Bob Cogswell, our pilot, was the last to jump from the burning B-17, and when his chute opened, it tore some ligaments in his back. Well, because of that, Bob was unable to finish his combat tour with the 303rd. But after his back healed, he returned to the States and began training on B-29s. My last 15 combat missions were less life-threatening than my first 15 because the American P-51 Mustang fighter plane joined the P-47 to give bombers long-range protection over enemy territory. And of course, by this time, the German Luftwaffe was growing steadily weaker. My original crew had been pretty badly battered in those earlier missions, and I flew my later missions as radio operator with di several different crews. I was on a B-17 named Virgin Mary, when the 8th Air Force launched its very first combat mission of the war against Berlin itself. This was on March 6th of 1944. It wasn't until my 24th mission 
that I had to send out an SOS again when it looked like our B-17 named Sweet Melody was going to crash or ditch in the North Sea. The date was April the 24th and the target was aircraft factories at Landsberg, Germany. The pilot's control cable was partially sheared by flak, the number two engine propeller was hit, there were holes in the nose section, and the radio compass junction box in my radio room was smashed. When the pilot said we were going to make it back to Molesworth after all, with a sigh of relief, I canceled the SOS signals with my Morse code key. I was wounded in the face just below the left eye by flak over Saarbrücken, Germany on the 30th and last mission of my combat tour. The wound was not very serious and at the base hospital that night I stole a nice line from Shakespeare and I told the flight surgeon all's well that ends well. So during the Second World War, I flew my first combat mission on July 10, 1943, my last mission on May 11, 1944, and of my original crew of 10, only P.J. Davis, our bold turret gunner, and I completed a full tour. Flying as a crew, we were so badly battered during our early missions that things fell apart. Some of my crewmates, including our pilot, were medically grounded, the rest were killed in combat, became prisoners of war when they were flying with other crews. Technical Sergeant Eddie Deerfield was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Purple Heart, the Air Medal with three oak leaf clusters, a Presidential Unit Citation and number of theater ribbons and battle stars. For a crash at sea, he was made a member of the Goldfish Club. And for the bailout from the burning bomber, became a member of the Caterpillar Club. I was sent back to Truax Field near Madison, Wisconsin to train on B-29s for the Pacific Theater. But the war was over before I could ship out. The leather jacket that I wore in combat in England is on display in the 8th Air Force Heritage Museum near Savannah. And I had the honor of meeting Mayor Daley in Chicago during the city celebration of World War II Veterans Week in 2003. On several trips back to England, I visited Old Oldsford, near where we had bailed out. Residents pointed out where our B-17 Lady Luck had crashed on the other side of a pond away from town. In fact, a local pilot very kindly took me up in his single-engine aircraft and we flew over the area where our crew had bailed out a half century earlier. Allsford recently established a memorial honoring our pilot for guiding the falling aircraft away from the town and some of those who saw the plane falling helped us honor our pilot. Now some notes on personal affairs. A few months before being honorably discharged from military duty in 1945, I married a girl from my neighborhood on Chicago's northwest side. It was a typical wartime romance. We had two fine sons, Jim and Rick, but we were divorced in 1960. In 1963, I married Mary Lee and we have enjoyed the strongest and most loving of marriages for more than 40 years. I could not have accomplished what I have in my life without her at my side. We had a deep personal tragedy. Our son Scott died of cancer in 1996 at the age of 30. Other tragedies were the death of my mother from cancer in 1960 and my father from pneumonia in 1966. My brother Dan, he's seen here sitting next to my father, fought as a Marine in some of the fiercest island battles in the Pacific and World War II. 
he died accidentally at age 54. And as for my sister Marion, she had some sort of falling out with my parents while I was still in service and left home for Los Angeles in about 1945. I tried for many years, but was never able to locate her. After leaving the Army Air Corps, I returned to the Chicago Times, first as an apprentice reporter in the sports department, and then as a writer in the Sunday department. I wrote a bylined column called Nightlife Notebook, and it covered performances by such stars of those days as Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, Lena Horne, Danny Thomas, Martha Ray, Doris Day, and the orchestras of Woody Herman, Les Brown, Stan Kenton, and Jimmy Dorsey. I also reviewed other theatrical events for about three years, and the Sunday Department editor even had me fill in as a model to illustrate articles in the paper. Then the Chicago Times was bought out, taken over by the Chicago Sun, and in the realignment, I was offered a transfer to the rewrite desk. Well, that didn't appeal to me, and so I decided to take advantage of the GI Bill and get the college education that I had never dreamed possible due to my family's financial circumstances. I wanted to attend Northwestern University, a private college in Evanston, just north of Chicago, then and now ranked as one of the best schools in the world for a degree in journalism. That's when my high school record caught up with me. I had finished scholastically at Thule High School in the lowest 10% of my graduating class. Northwestern turned down my application, and it was a devastating blow. I was still determined to be accepted by Northwestern. I would not give up. I managed to get into the University of Illinois on probation, and after a year, with a straight A average and initiation into the Phi Eta Sigma, that's the freshman honorary fraternity, I applied a second time at Northwestern. Well, this time I was accepted, but again on probation. I finished my sophomore year at Northwestern with an A average, was taken off probation, and in 1949 was initiated into Sigma Delta Chi, a professional journalistic fraternity, and I received my Bachelor of Science degree in journalism in 1950. While studying for a degree in journalism at Northwestern, I accepted a commission as a second lieutenant in the Army Reserve. Less than a year later, after graduation, April 1951, I was called up during the Korean War to serve in a psychological warfare unit known as the First Radio Broadcasting and Leaflet Group. We had three months training at Fort Riley, Kansas, and then left for Japan on a troop ship, the General Brewster. During the voyage, we entertained the troops with a musical performance of Little Nell, I Played the Heavy. And when we docked in Yokohama, a band welcomed us to Japan. Group headquarters was in the Daiichi building in Tokyo. Our living quarters were in the Yoraku Hotel. It was near the hotel that I met a street artist who specialized in painting portraits. I arranged for five or six sittings at the hotel and after some time, he completed this oil painting. I was assigned to take command of a detachment of 10 enlisted men and sent to Pusan, Korea. We lived in tents on the compound of radio station HLKA in Pusan, which at that time was the network base station of the Korean broadcasting system. It remained so during the war. We were responsible for the preparation and broadcast of all news and special events on the network. Our scripts were written in English by my men, 
and then translated by local staff into Korean and Chinese for broadcast throughout the Korean Peninsula and into China in the native languages. Our mission was to explain to listeners why United Nations military forces were in Korea, that we were fighting the evils of communist dictatorship, and at the same time encouraging the establishment of free and democratic government. We broadcast news and commentaries, sports, even stories for children, reports from the field, and musical interludes. And we reported on meetings between our military leaders and the Korean head of government. Here are General Van Fleet, General Ridgway, President Syngman Rhee, and his wife. One of my responsibilities was to visit the residence of the President of Korea to record his speeches for broadcast and to interview him as a news source. The problem was that President Rhee's ideas were not always in tune with the United Nations Command's plans for conducting the war. So there I was, a first lieutenant, having to tell the president of the country what he could and could not broadcast to his own people. He took this awkward situation pretty well. In fact, I was later commended by the Republic of Korea. The citation by the Republic of Korea reads, in part, to First Lieutenant Eddie Deerfield, for exceptionally meritorious conduct in the performance of outstanding services to the Republic through aggressive leadership, excellent professional knowledge, and sound planning ability, which contributed in a high measure to the successes of psychological warfare. His conduct reflects great credit upon himself and the military service of the United Nations. When compared to the dangers of my air combat missions in World War II, my service in Korea was not life-threatening. Actually, the greatest danger was on a 12-hour drive by jeep from Busan to Seoul, and then my return trip with my driver, Mr. Moon. We drove over bad roads and through areas where North Korean guerrillas on hilltops were firing down on military vehicles. One of my personal feel-good things that I was able to accomplish in Pusan was possibly saving the life of a little Korean girl. Her father was one of my translators. He came to my tent late one night to tell me in anguish that his daughter needed urgent medical attention and he was not able to get her admitted into any hospital. I was able to arrange a bed for her in an American military hospital. The medical diagnosis was spinal meningitis, but the doctors came through for us and the little girl survived. It was the Christmas season and one of the newswire services picked up the story and they wrote it comparing it to the biblical reference to no room at the inn. I had kept up a correspondence with Bob Cogswell, as you may recall, was my World War II pilot, who was now flying B-29s against the North Korean enemy from a base in Okinawa. It really hit me hard when one of my letters to him came back unopened and marked missing in action. The North Sea was kind to us when we crashed in 1943. Bob's B-29 crashed in the Yellow Sea with the loss of most of his crew. His body was never recovered. After the Korean War, I joined the news staff of WGN Television in Chicago as an editor and broadcaster, interviewing a wide range of people. Here are three clips covering international affairs, a local murder, and a New Year's Eve celebration in Chicago. Commander Chu Hak, did you have any fears about stepping into a job that may have cost Charles Gross's life? No, I didn't, and <clears throat> at the time I 
was asked to get into the race, I knew very little about politics, and I don't know whether it was ignorance or the fact that I felt there was nothing to fear. I had no qualms about entering into the race. Has there been any political or police pressure on you uh, since you accepted the job of Republican Ward Committee man? Well, by police pressure, do you mean investigation of the case? And yes, the, that's right. Have you been able to help them, or have they uh, worked with you in any way? Well, certainly the police are still very interested in finding the murder of Gross, and they have been in touch with me on several occasions. And so far as political pressure is concerned, I certainly have my headaches and my work cut out for me. Uh, from what you've learned as ward committee man, uh, do you have any idea why Gross was shot? Do you think patronage had anything to do with it? Ed, I just don't know. I, uh, I have inquired of everyone that I've come in contact with out here, and to date, I can't say that I have found one single clue that the police already did not have at the time uh, that I took over. I'm just at a complete loss to give an explanation as to why that man was killed. Uh, tell me, General, do you advocate preventive war now to uh, avoid possible greater disadvantages in a later war? Well, I have never advocated uh, fighting a preventative war. I do not uh, advocate that we do so at the present time. Uh, I've been misquoted uh, on that as a result of the testimony that I gave before the Jenner Internal Security Committee of the Senate. Uh, what I do advocate is that we never again fight a piddling kind of a war that we fought in Korea with our hands tied behind us. What I have advocated repeatedly is that when the responsible leaders of my country, as a result of our vital interests being so jeopardized that fight we must, then that we fight without any holes barred. We shoot the works to win with every weapon at our disposal. Well, how far should we go then with the U.S. Armed Forces and the defense of Formosa? Well, that's a decision that uh, fortunately is not mine. That's uh, the big one for my government to, uh, to decide, and I'm not in now on those uh, deliberations, but I think I'm not misquoting the president when he said that if the Chinese Reds did decide to attack Formosa, that they would have to run over the Seventh Fleet. I commanded the Seventh Fleet in the Far East, and I know that would be something to run over. So I'm sure that it is our intention to defend Formosa. And I might add that I don't think the Chinese Reds have any intention of attempting to take it. I don't think they can take it. Well, on the subject of, uh, of communism, General Clark, do you concur with the court-martial decision in the Fleming case? Well, I haven't followed it too closely. I do know that he was uh, convicted. Uh, naturally, uh, uh, he will appeal that case. It'll go before a review board in uh, Washington. But uh, I've always felt that uh, the higher a man is uh, in communist captivity, uh, the more uh, uh, courageous and determined he must be that by no act of his he do anything that would uh, make the life harder for his fellow prisoners. So I'll leave the uh, judgment to the hands of the able court. Okay, one thing more, General. Uh, do you feel, as chairman of the Hoover Commission, that you'll find communism in high places in government? Well, I don't know. My mission as the, uh, uh, the chairman of this uh, task force to study the CIA uh, is to study its functions and its organizations. I would say that, uh, naturally, in doing so, if we did get any indication that there was any infiltration of communism in the CIA, that uh, uh, we would uh, go into that. Whether we find any or not, I don't know. I do know, uh, I have no reason to believe that there are any there. I've been in the Far East where I worked with the CIA, and uh, I know something about it. Say, Eddie, weren't you going to ask me some questions about the Chaparee? 
Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah George, I'll be I'm very sorry. glad to answer anything you uh, uh, want to answer. <laughs> All right, George. Now, here's the first question. Uh, All right. How are reservations coming along for tonight? We're completely sold out, I'm happy to say. Fine. And how long have you been sold out? Well, uh, as soon as... Uh, well, of course, we started to get sold out when people thought Joe Lewis was going to be here. <laughs> now, we've been sold out for quite some... Uh, to be, As a matter of fact, I believe when it was first announced that this show was going to come in, they seemed to go right for it. Uh, George, what will the uh, charge be in the shade tonight per person? Uh, Fifteen dollars per person. And that includes what? Oh, that includes an awful lot. First of all, they get a lot of favors when they come in to have fun with. Then they get uh, uh, hors d'oeuvres. Then they get a seven-course dinner. And then, of course, a good show. And uh, uh, what what is the show going to consist of tonight? Uh, well, it's uh, the wonderful dancers, the acrobatic dancers, the Terry sisters, and that very, very great artist, uh, Joyce Bryant, and myself. Now, you say also that includes the food. Uh, what will the food uh, consist of primarily? You mean the, what they're going to serve? Yes. Will they have oh, a choice? I, uh, yes, a choice. I haven't been in the kitchen. I'll be there in a few <laughs> minutes. And I, the way I figure it, $15 is, uh, uh, well, I would say the food, about a quarter, and $14.75 to see me. <laughs> or right. maybe just the way around. George, talking, talking about around. that, talking about that, seeing you, what do you have planned tonight that's extra special for New Year's Eve? Well, because I've been coming to Chicago since I've been a little bit of a boy, I think there's a little bit more warmth about a New Year's Eve in Chicago than there would be if I were just one of these Johnny Newcomers that was born out of this thing <laughs> that the devil conjured up to put show business out in the cold. <laughs> Uh, and so I think there'll be a nice toaster to finish, and I'm trying to fix up some kind of a song which will include Old Lang Syne, Chicago, Give My Regards to Broadway, uh, Here Comes Kennelly, <laughs> and uh, the Hanukkah Mambo. That's about <laughs> all I can think of. Sounds very good, Bob. Say, can I interrupt your rehearsal? Oh, As sure you come you down, can. we'll talk to you for a bit. Okay. Something tall. Let's not break anything before <laughs> New Year's Eve. How are you doing? How are you? Uh, Bob, the first thing I want to check on is uh, how are reservations coming for tonight? Well, it looks like it's practically sold out. We still have some places, though, I think. I see. And uh, what are your... Uh, do you have a minimum or cover charge here? Yes, it's uh, $10 per person plus tax. $10 per person mm -hmm. plus tax. That's right. And uh, what does Mr. and Mrs. Chicago get for that $10 plus tax? Well, they can get a, a choice of uh, one of the five dinners, uh, you know, one of the five uh, main course. Five main courses. That's right. Plus uh, a cocktail and, uh, and uh, offers. What is it? Gifts? Offers? What is it? Oh, uh, you mean... Favors. Uh, favors. Uh, <laughs> that's right. And your, your main dinners would be uh, stage and stage, chops and things jobs, like that. fish, that's right. Bob, uh, who's on stage now uh, with you and the uh, Black Orchid? Well, we have the Miller Locks, which is a group, you fire three girls and a... Uh, three girls? Well, they'll be happy. Three boys and a girl. <laughs> and uh, Naomi Stevens, uh, she's a comedian singer. Singing comedian. That's, that's a singing right. comedian, and I. Do you, uh, you yourself have anything particular planned for New Year's Eve to entertain the guests? Well, I guess over before, just before midnight, uh, we're all going to come together and sing. Oh, it reminds me, I have to go and rehearse the old Lang Syne, that's the word, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to learn the English lyrics, so I have to rehearse. By midnight? It. Yes, by midnight, <laughs> that's right. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Honolulu Harry, I think things are shaping up for tonight, aren't they? Fine, wonderful. Are your uh, girls in their last rehearsal before the big night? Yes, sir, this is the last rehearsal. How are reservations coming along? We are booked solid until midnight. For the first show? Yes, sir. Are still taking two, two shows. Oh, for the first two shows. First show is 8.30 and second is at 11 o'clock. I see. How long ago were your reservations complete for the first show? About two weeks now. What is your uh, cover charge here? 250. And what is your minimum? Two and a half also. The minimum covers drinks? Yes. What does the cover charge uh, include? The cover charge includes uh, all the favors. And what will you be serving? Anything special tonight? Oh, yes. We have uh, Cantonese food as usual and also delicious American dishes. 
Have you guys worked out any new acts for tonight? Why, wonderful. We have a new, special New Year's act for tonight. In other words, uh, they're all set and you're all ready all to go. Ready, ready to go. A jam-packed crowd. All ready to go. We have a bang-up New Year's Eve. you anticipate any special program here for New Year's Eve? No, nothing special. Same routine. Same clientele, no change in pro program. Just another day. Happy New Year. I remained in the U.S. Army Reserves, meeting weekly in civil affairs units based in Chicago, and going on active duty for two weeks each year, usually to Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. We pitched tents on bivouac, trained with a Colt 45 automatic, prepared maps for defense exercises, and I was assigned to do a camp newsletter that earned a plaque from the 308th Civil Affairs Group. Throughout my 30 years in the Army Reserve Corps, I continued to train every year at the Pentagon or at various military bases, including a two-week tour with the U.S. Army in Korea Long after the war, this was in 1970, I took correspondence courses from the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. I was active in the ROA, the Reserve Officers Association, and in 1965 was elected Vice President in the State of Illinois Chapter. Among my duties in ROA was to brief senior military officers before they participated in television news panels. I found time also for amateur theater in Hoffman Estates, a suburb northwest of Chicago, and over the years performed in such amateur productions as The Tender Trap, Harvey, Sabrina Fair, George Washington Slept Here, and The Emperor's New Clothes. I guess I would have to say though that my greatest accomplishment in my short career as an actor was the role of Eddie Fuseli in a professional production of Golden Boy. And I was paid the non-equity wage of $45 a week for the play's six-week run at the Starlight Dinner Theater in Wheeling, Illinois. My proudest accomplishment, though, in the community of Hoffman Estates was election in 1957 to the town's first board of trustees by the largest number of votes among 10 candidates. After eight years at WGN, I resigned for a position in corporate public relations for the usual reason, to make more money. I started with a small PR firm called Oscar Katoff and company, and one of our clients was a Chevrolet dealership. The owner recommended me to the home office for a promotional film being produced by General Motors. I'm Ted Hopkins, Chevrolet National Sales Promotion Manager. These fine gentlemen with me all hold responsible positions in a business related to the advertising field. They're experts, and they're here to discuss with us some of the problems related to retail advertising. From this discussion will come ideas which will assist you in administering this very important responsibility in sales management. Before getting into this discussion, I'd like to present these gentlemen. First is Mr. Eddie Deerfield, an account executive with Oscar Katov and Company, an advertising and public relations agency in Chicago. Next is Mr. James Leach, general sales manager at Folk Chevrolet Incorporated, Akron, Ohio. Mr. Bob Wheeler, 
advertising director of the Detroit Free Press, Detroit, Michigan, and Mr. Thomas R. Noonan, director of marketing communications, Crosley Corporation, New York City. Before they make up their mind, what sort of automobile they're going to buy. Well, both radio uh, and newspapers uh, certainly do an excellent job of bringing the sales message to the public. And as an account executive, uh, I use them constantly. But I do want to point out what the function of an advertising agency is. And this is to counsel the sales manager in a, a totally integrated program. Now what we would do is evaluate all of the media. We would determine whether newspapers should be combined with radio, direct mail, billboards, where the emphasis should be, uh, which one or all of them should be used to give the sales manager the best means of selling his vehicles at the lowest cost. Now once an advertising agency develops this media plan, then the creative people can go to work and they can actually produce, write, and handle all of the technical aspects of a complete advertising program. Jim, I wanted to comment on a, uh, a remark you made earlier in which you said that large dealerships uh, perhaps can use an agency and should. Uh, this is a fallacy in thinking on the part of too many automobile dealers. Uh, advertising by uh, an agency where those services are professionally handled is not a costly operation because there are just as many competent small agencies as there are small dealerships. I joined Theodore R. Sills Incorporated, an international PR firm, as an account executive. A few years later, I was promoted to vice president in the Chicago office. One of our clients was Swift & Company, owner of Derby Foods, maker of Peter Pan peanut butter. Now that was a fun product to handle. My proposal to establish a Peter Pan peanut butter museum generated stories in papers all over the country. Well, the money was good, but there was something lacking. Serving my country has always been of paramount importance to me, and publicizing commercial products just did, did not seem to satisfy that need. The year was 1966. The war in Vietnam was raging, and the Cold War with the Soviet Union, they were both a constant threat. The United States Information Agency was sending out urgent calls for help in telling America's story to the world. So early that year, when a team of USIA recruiters came to Chicago, I took the oral and written examinations for the U.S. Foreign Service. The recruiters then interviewed both me and my wife, and a short time after that, we were invited to come to Washington for preliminary briefings. Ted Sills gave me a two-year leave of absence, certain in his mind that I would be back to the firm. Six months later, I was in Madras in India with Mary Lee, one-year-old Scott, and Tom and Mark, Mary Lee's children by a previous marriage, to begin a career as an American diplomat. Our first home overseas was called Mayfair, built in the British colonial style, large and gracious, although it wasn't long before we were introduced to floods caused each year by cyclones. I was 42 years old when I arrived at the American consulate in Madras in 1966 with the title information officer to begin my first Foreign Service assignment. As I look back on my years as a Chicago Times reporter, WGN TV news editor, and corporate public relations executive, I wasn't sure what I was getting into now. Chester Bowles was our ambassador in New Delhi, and I liked what I had read about him. My first speaking engagement in Madras was to talk to a crowd attending the inauguration of an American space exploration exhibit. Chief Minister Anajarai 
Now that's the equivalent rank of a state governor in the U.S. was there along with the Consul General. I felt I could be most useful traveling through the four states of southern India to meet with the media and a wide variety of audiences to address the Vietnam issue. I made book presentations, spoke to Lions Club audiences, cut ribbons at art displays, inaugurated a basketball tournament, moderated a discussion on the role of small business in the U.S. and India, and even presented a typewriter to an association of journalists. I met with and exchanged views with the Vice President of India and the Governor of the State of Maharashtra when they visited Madras for a ceremonial function. I lectured extensively at colleges in Madras, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Trivandrum, and smaller communities. I worked in harmony with the editors of scores of Indian newspapers to tell America's story. Now my goal was not so much to defend our role in the Vietnam War, but to explain the events leading up to our involvement and our rationale for being there. I arranged a grant for the editor of an Indian communist newspaper in Madras to visit the U.S. and see for himself. And on his return, that paper's editorials were far more reasonable and less critical than they had been. An event that gained considerable favorable publicity was the presentation of the Helms Trophy to the year's most outstanding international tennis player, India's Krishnan. It was covered in English language journals as well as in the local language press. I escorted a group of journalists from Calcutta on a visit to a NASA space flight center in South India and briefed Ambassador Bowles, uh, he's in the center here, when he brought a delegation from New Delhi to Madras. It's hard to gauge the positive effects of public diplomacy. It's as much an art as it is a science. The Communist Party was strong in parts of South India, particularly in the state of Kerala. There were frequent protest marches ending at our USIS Cultural Center in Trivandrum. Recognition that I was making an impact came about in a very unusual way. About a year after I arrived in Madras, the Soviet Union's news agency TASS sent a story to the Indian media accusing me of being the Central Intelligence Agency chief for South India. It was one of their Cold War weapons. Well, that disinformation tactic of naming me as a CIA master spy didn't work. Happily, I had earned the trust of my Indian contacts. Mary Lee and I enjoyed our assignment to India. She was often at the microphone as chief guest at various charitable and social events. We found time, though, to visit the Taj Mahal and see it in the light of a full moon, and spent a memorable week at an island palace near Jaipur in a suite with dazzling stained glass windows. We saw the traditional Indian method of doing laundry and the method for drying. We saw men constructing buildings and women cheerfully bringing them the bricks. Scott was now almost three years old and our German shepherd puppy named Raja had grown into a formidable watchdog. And it was time to move on to another country. In Islamabad, the new capital of Pakistan, I served in the office of Ambassador Joseph Farland as press attaché. My principal duty was to advise him on public diplomacy issues and to accompany him on travels throughout Pakistan. I wrote speeches and policy statements for the ambassador and helped arrange his public appearances. Sometimes the going was rough. Crowds waving anti-American signs and banners 
would attack our vehicle with sticks and curses. The Pakistani police didn't interfere, but stood by to make sure the violence never got out of hand. And we endured a military coup in March of 1969. On November 12, 1970, East Pakistan, which later gained its independence and became Bangladesh, suffered a devastating cyclone and tsunami which claimed an estimated 200,000 lives. As emergency supplies for the survivors began to arrive from the United States, I went to Dhaka in East Pakistan with the ambassador. We were aboard an, a U.S. Army Huey helicopter as bags of food were dropped to the survivors. I had the responsibility of planning and conducting news briefings for scores of American journalists who swarmed into the area. Later that year, the State Department presented me with a meritorious honor award. The citation for the Department of State's meritorious honor award reads, To Eddie Deerfield, for extraordinary skill and dedicated service in establishing and conducting under great pressure and extremely difficult operating conditions, a highly professional and imaginative information program for U.S. news correspondents in East Pakistan in the aftermath of the cyclone disaster of November 12, 1970. The ambassador was an enthusiastic sportsman, so traveling with him meant an opportunity to fish and hunt. In the far north of Pakistan, trout fishing was great fun, and we ate the catch that night. Chuck Yeager, the first man to fly faster than the speed of sound, had been assigned to our embassy as U.S. Air Force attaché, and we went duck hunting together. There were the usual social engagements, both with Pakistani friends and with representatives of other embassies in Islamabad. There was even a pharmacy in the, in the nearby city of Rawalpindi, which seemed to be able to treat any medical problem. We had a, a small th American theater group in the diplomatic community, and I appeared on stage in a two-act play called The Typist and the Tiger. My most vivid memory was not the performance itself, but the desperate effort to get back to Islamabad from Chitral in northern Pakistan by jeep. Over the mountains, th through a sudden snowstorm in the mountain passes, so that I could go on stage that evening, and we did make it. My third posting was at the American Embassy in Blantyre, Malawi, in East Central Africa. H. Kamuzu Banda was the self-styled President for Life when I arrived in 1971 as Public Affairs Officer. At best, he was a benevolent dictator, but not keen on having democracy preached in his country. I arranged exchange programs, bringing in American professors to lecture at the University of Malawi, and sending local leaders to the U.S. on various grants. We had a program on the life of Martin Luther King, a space program on the Apollo mission, an exhibition honoring Malawi's leading soapstone artists, opened by the mayor of the city of Blantyre. There was a presentation of books to Chancellor College of the University of Malawi, and even a gift of a motorcycle to the country's Red Cross Society. American musical talent came to Malawi to entertain our audiences. I have to believe, though, that my most effective action was publishing a 20-page monthly magazine called USA News. The contents were selected to emphasize the advantages of living in a democracy. The publication was circulated across a wide spectrum of Malawian society and generated many favorable comments from readers. This advocacy of democratic principles was a continuing thorn in President Banda's side. 
Remember, he had already declared himself president for life. But the closest I came to being annihilated in Malawi was not due to political action. While fishing alone on Lake Malawi, about a mile offshore, a sudden storm overturned my boat. I wasn't wearing a life jacket, but there was one in the boat, and I managed to put it on while holding to the side of the boat before it sank underwater. Now, that was about five in the afternoon. It took me three hours of fighting the stormy waves to finally swim and reach a rocky outcrop in the bay just off the shoreline. It was pitch dark by then. Well, I planned to spend the night on those rocks rather than take a chance on walking through the jungle in order to look for the nearest house. Mary Lee had sent out the alarm when I failed to return, and about 10 o'clock that night, she was on a boat with a powerful searchlight. She spotted me on the rocks, and the boat took me aboard. The next day, the Malawi Times carried a story of, quote, near disaster, end quote, for an American diplomat, and it was picked up by the Reuters news agency. The story commented that the bay I reached was infested by crocodiles and snakes. I was able to continue my duck hunting with Malawi friends and to observe wild game from hidden blinds. Well, after almost eight years abroad, my next assignment was in the Washington office of the U.S. Information Agency as chief of the Africa Press Branch. I headed a staff of about 25 Foreign Service and Civil Service personnel who prepared and transmitted to all our posts in Sub-Saharan Africa a daily news roundup called the Wireless File. It contained the latest news, features, and official texts, and was high priority reading for every officer at every African post from the ambassador on down. I attended regional conferences in Africa and met with field officers to exchange ideas on how to improve the file's content, and of course pre presented awards to the most deserving of our staff members. In 1976, the agency was ready to send me overseas again. I wanted an assignment in the Near East, South Asia area, or in Africa. Instead, a benevolent personnel office sent me to Vancouver, Canada. I was to establish the first U.S. Information Agency branch post serving the four western provinces of Canada. That responsibility had been handled in the past out of our embassy in Ottawa. I located office space, hired staff, and began three years of contacts with political leaders, prominent journalists, university, community, and cultural leaders with the goal of improving U.S.-Canadian relations on contentious issues. A highly respected American professor of economics accepted my invitation to lecture at universities in British Columbia. And as things worked out, he was the recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics the following year. I traveled extensively through British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, and enjoyed the challenges and opportunities to explain United States policies as they related to our northern neighbor. Rosalind Carter, President Carter's wife, came to Vancouver to attend the conference on the problems of mental health, and I worked with her and the White House staff in arranging the visit. Oh yes, I didn't miss out on the opportunity to do some salmon fishing north of the border, and there were the usual social engagements. After three years, I again asked the USIA assignment people 
to send me to a post in Africa or back to the Indian subcontinent. I got far more than I bargained for. In 1979, shortly after the overthrow of the brutal dictator Idi Amin in Uganda, I was assigned to Kampala as public affairs officer. My mission was to establish the first USIS presence since the severing of diplomatic relations seven years earlier. The United States and other foreign governments had calculated that there would be relative peace in Uganda after Amin fled the country and a highly respected university leader was installed as president. They were wrong. The new president lasted about six months and there were two bloody coups followed by a tainted election. My wife and I flew from Washington to Nairobi, Kenya, where I was to pick up a Volkswagen Combi van and drive it across the border into Uganda, a journey of several hundred miles. Before leaving Nairobi, the American embassy arranged to have their marine guards take us out to a Kenyan police gunnery range for target practice. We worked with a 12-gauge police shotgun and a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver. Mary Lee's shoulder was black and blue for several weeks after that. She said if she ever had to use the shotgun, she would shoot from the hip. Well, we were issued both those weapons, as well as ammunition, tear gas grenades, gas masks, bulletproof vests, and steel helmets, which we loaded into the van for the drive to Kampala. The border crossing in the van from Kenya into Uganda was a hairy experience. The African nation of Tanzania had helped in the overthrow of Idi Amin and its troops, armed with AK-47 machine guns, controlled the borders. Their soldiers in camouflage uniforms were mostly illiterate young men from Tanzanian villages, unable to recognize or understand the meaning of a diplomatic license plate or diplomatic passports. Things turned really tense when I refused to let them search the van. There was a standoff of about a half hour, during which I said repeatedly in English, American Embassy Diplomat, American Embassy Diplomat. Nothing worked. Finally, I just yelled, now I go, I go. And I began to drive slowly away from the border checkpoint, expecting a hail of gunfire in our direction. We never looked back until the van was well out of their range. Uganda was in a state of anarchy. One morning a few months after we arrived in Kampala, my Ugandan driver was shot and killed and the USIS van stolen less than 10 minutes after he dropped me off at the new American Embassy. In another episode, at 3 o'clock in the morning, my wife and I were under attack in our residence, and I drove the, gu the gang off with gunfire from the 38 caliber revolver that, which had been issued to me at the American Embassy in Nairobi. The violence was not directed at us as Americans, but was by criminals intent on stealing whatever they could get their hands on. And they killed as they robbed indiscriminately. The police were helpless. They were outgunned by the bandits. This was the closest to combat since my time in World War II. No, USIS Kampala was not business as usual. Gordon Beyer, our ambassador, and the entire embassy staff were ready to tough it out 
and he gave me unlimited support. Among our contacts was Milton Obote, who later emerged as president of Uganda. I found the vacant building for a cultural center, furnished it, hired staff, brought in books, and opened the USIS library, which was crowded from day one. Relations with McCary University were reestablished. A visiting American professor was brought in. Ugandan scholars, journalists, and other potential leaders were sent to the U.S. on international visitor grants. Our German shepherd, Raja, had passed away, and we acquired Happy from a family leaving the post. Two diverse and unique USIS projects stand out. We helped refurbish the National Theater of Uganda for the production of Thornton Wilder's The Skin of Our Teeth. I directed an all-Ugandan cast, and the two leads in the production were honored that year with the Ugandan equivalent of Broadway's Tony Awards. Working hand-in-hand -hand with the Uganda Sports Press Association, we helped organize the nation's first major soccer tournament in years. For two weeks, a huge American flag flew atop the stadium next to the Ugandan flag as some 20,000 fans cheered their teams. Near the end of my tour, I received the USIA's Superior Honor Award. The citation for the U.S. Information Agency's Superior Honor Award reads, To Eddie Deerfield, for outstanding performance in re-establishing an agency office in the turbulent war-ravaged nation of Uganda, and for consistent excellence and creativity in carrying out operations and in an unpredictable and violent security environment. The embassy asked Mary Lee to try to revive the old international school, which had almost ceased to exist during Idi Amin's regime. As headmistress, she did a magnificent job in rehabilitating the school property, hiring teachers, and building a student body of more than 80 children of grammar school age. The teachers, parents, an entire student body held a farewell ceremony in her honor and presented her with flowers, a silver bowl, and an engraved crystal bowl. And the Department of State awarded Mary Lee a Tribute of Appreciation certificate. In 1982, my next assignment was to Lagos, Nigeria, to head the largest USIS operation in Sub-Saharan Africa. I had the pleasure of managing a huge budget and a talented staff of American Foreign Service officers and Nigerian nationals. As a member of the country team, I worked closely with Thomas Pickering, recognized as one of America's most capable ambassadors. We developed a comprehensive program on all aspects of public diplomacy. There were not only many meetings with the media, but Nigerian reporters were able to hold press conferences with leading American officials in Washington on USIA's World Television Network. There was a military coup but it was relatively peaceful as those things go, and the change of government had little or no effect on U.S.-Nigerian relations. Among the highlights was the Post's coverage of the 1984 U.S. presidential election for our African audience, a series of events which earned us USIA's annual award for creativity. We were instrumental, too, in securing the support of American business interests in Nigeria 
for that country's Olympic boxing team. The highest ranking American to visit Lagos during my assignment was the senior George Bush, then Vice President of the United States. My three-year assignment to Nigeria came to an end in 1985. The ambassador at that time was Thomas Smith, and he hosted a gala farewell for us at his residence. I was facing mandatory retirement in 1988 at the age of 65. I had been asked to return to Washington for my final tour of duty, but I wanted to finish in the field preferably in India, where I had started my diplomatic career two decades earlier. The position of branch public affairs officer in Calcutta was open. Professionally, it was a step down from my position as country PAO in Lagos, but at this stage of my career, a career move was not high on my personal agenda. Our posts in India have always had outstanding staffs of national personnel, and Calcutta was among the better of the best. Our Indian staff's relationships with the media, university, and cultural communities was strong, enabling me to accept speaking engagements and meet local leaders throughout Northeast India for exchanges of views on a wide variety of America-oriented subjects. I moderated a seminar for journalists on media power in a democracy, conducting briefings for journalists on American foreign policy, inaugurated art exhibitions, addressed Rotary Club meetings, spoke to students and faculty at numerous colleges, met with members of the Indo-American Society. At one of our seminars on the American political system, former California Governor Jerry Brown was our principal speaker. We introduced Calcutta audiences to visiting American entertainers on tour for the U.S. Information Agency, and this included performances of the musical Once Upon a Mattress, and a country music band called the New Grass Revival. Mary Lee offered to help Mother Teresa by teaching English as a second language to novices coming in from the villages of India to join the missionaries of charity, and she also raised money for the Holy Order. I guess my biggest surprise in the Calcutta assignment was an invitation to play a role in film director B. Joy Chatterjee's production of Dristadon, based on a story by Tagore. After getting clearance from our embassy in New Delhi, I accepted and was cast as an eminent surgeon in India during the Victorian era. I tried to save the eyesight of a young woman going blind because of lack of proper care. Mary Lee has a walk-on role as a patron in a chemist shop. Here are some scenes from the film. Does your wife understand English? No, sir. Ask her if she sees the light. Roshni dekh rahi ho kumu. All right, what about now? Up.
Count my fingers. How many fingers? कितनी उंगलियां Tell your wife to look straight ahead. कुमो बिल्कुल सीधा देखो Who has been treating your wife? Me, sir. You? Do you realize she's totally blind in her left eye and almost blind in her right? Shocking. Most shocking. Mr. Roy, if you really want to save your wife from total blindness, she must have an operation on her right eye immediately. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Well, I think the operation went well. Let's hope for the best. But she must have complete bed rest for at least a month. After that, I'll remove the bandages. God bless her. कौन कैसे? अन्य से पहले माँ कैसे हमेशा बिस्तर पर लेटी रहती थी ना भैया? बेकार की बातें छोड़ चल सो जा Now tell your wife to open her eyes slowly, very slowly. Kumu, ab aankhe kholo. Bahut dheere. Itna 
अंधेरा क्यों मुझे कुछ नहीं दिखाई दे रहा है कुमो शांत हो जा शांत हो जा कुमो शांत हो जा शांत हो जा शांत हो जा कुमो कोशिश कर देखने की कोशिश कर to her. She needs you. I do recall having to go through some of Calcutta's flooded streets to reach the place where the production was being filmed. After three years in northeastern India, it was time to pack up and leave, but there was still time to attend the annual United States Marine Ball in the Grand Hotel in downtown Calcutta. Mary Lee and I were honored at an oil lamp lighting ceremony by Calcutta's cultural community. Always a sad occasion to say goodbye to colleagues and other friends in the host country, but it's a familiar feeling to any American diplomat who has served in posts overseas. On retiring in 1988, I was honored once more by my colleagues at USIA headquarters in Washington with a Career Achievement Award. My rank at retirement was counselor in the Senior Foreign Service. The citation for the U.S. Information Agency's Career Achievement Award reads, to Eddie Deerfield, for over two decades of distinguished service as a Foreign Service officer, serving with a high degree of professionalism in Asia and Africa, as well as in Canada and Washington, to promote a better understanding of his country among peoples abroad. A wonderful byproduct of all those years abroad was the opportunity to travel extensively for both business and pleasure, by ship, by air, by train, and on the road. There was Cozumel, an island off the coast of Mexico, Mexico City, Alaska, Shakespeare's Stratford-on-Avon in England, the canals of Venice, Italy's Leaning Tower of Pisa, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, a palace in Madrid, a street artist in Moscow and his charcoal sketch of Mary Lee, on horseback in Kashmir, and a camel ride in Egypt. Scott got along with a friendly monkey in Thailand the Dead Sea in Israel, the road to Kabul in Afghanistan, the equator in Kenya, and the equator in Uganda, the city of Kathmandu in Nepal, and children in the remote mountain kingdom of Bhutan. By this time, I was retired from the Army Reserves as a Lieutenant Colonel with an accumulation of military and civilian medals. So, I guess you could say I've had four careers. Newspaper and television journalism, corporate public relations, 
foreign service, and the military. It's nice at this time of my life to be able to look back and say I don't regret any of those careers. Mary Lee and I celebrated our 42nd wedding anniversary on August 3rd of this year, 2005. At last count, our three sons have given us five grandchildren, all girls. Jim's daughters are Cindy and Donna. Rick's daughters are Tracy and, of course, the newest arrival, baby Samantha. Scott's daughter is Anastasia. Jim is married to Jerry and Rick's bride is Jody. When Jim, Rick and I get together, we're known to the family as the Silver Foxes. Granddaughter Cindy became a bride last June, so maybe we'll become great-grandparents before long. I've had the time in retirement to do something I've always wanted to do, write a novel. My book, The Psy Warriors, was published in April of 1994, and it had nice reviews in the Chicago Sun-Times by Bob Hergeth and columnist Irv Kupsonet. It's about six U.S. Army reservists called up to serve in the Korean War. They think they're safe behind the lines, but are caught up in an attack by North Korean guerrillas. Pretty exciting reading, even if I do say so myself. I was invited by bookstores in the Chicago and Tampa Bay areas to meet their customers, sign my books as they were sold. Not exactly a New York Times bestseller, but it was great fun writing and did bring in about $12,000 in royalties. In 2002, I was editor of a two-volume hardbound collection of 25 years of the 303rd Bomb Group Association's newsletter. That was my World War II unit. It's titled Hell's Angels Newsletter Silver Anniversary Collection, a World War II Retrospective. 500 sets were printed. 40 of them were donated by the association to 15 university libraries. This is at Northwestern University. 11 museum libraries. 10 U.S. Air Force Base libraries, and this is at MacDill Air Force Base, and four national and community libraries, including the Chicago Public Library seen here. The remaining 460 sets were sold within a few months to our veterans and family members. I was elected president of the 303rd Bomb Group Association in 1996 at our reunion in San Francisco where I made my acceptance speech. In my careers in the military of World War II and in Korea, in the diplomatic corps, where I served at American embassies in seven countries, for my work in the fields of print and television journalism and the public relations, I have been blessed in the last 50 years with a considerable number of honors. I say to you now in all humility that the honor you bestow upon me tonight makes this one of the proudest moments of my life. I have to make a comment now in the best tradition of all the Republican and Democratic politicians who are campaigning for office and regaling us with stories about their humble beginnings. I too had a humble beginning. I was an enlisted man at Molesworth.
I first learned about the 303rd Bond Group Association about seven years ago, shortly after retiring from the Foreign Service. Mary Lee and I were living near Washington, D.C. at the time, and my son Scott was at a gas station when he noticed the 303rd Bomb Group sticker on the car next to him. He told the driver that his father had served with the 303rd, and he made a note of the fellow's name and telephone number, gave it to me that evening, and that's how I first learned about the association. <coughs> Scott passed away a few months ago <clears throat> after a long bout with cancer. And with your kind permission, I'd like to dedicate my presidency in his memory. I won't take the time tonight to tell you in detail what my goals are for my term of office. Uh, with Hell Suskin's help, the next Hell's Angels newsletter will cover that. I do want to summarize, however, what I consider to be one of the most important goals. First and foremost, to use the best talents in the group to prepare and implement an organized campaign to locate and inform every person whoever served the most were in the 303rd, that we have an association, we have reunions, come join us for an experience you will never forget. One of the greatest pleasures I have had is in being reunited after half a century with fellows I served with at Molesworth. We need more than bumper stickers to bring people in. Secondly, to use the best talents in the group to find or develop a computer database and the means for a systematic input of all the details of the 303rd's illustrious history. Posterity demands this, so that long after we're gone, in this age of high tech and the internet and even greater communication to come, the world will have a record of who we were and what we accomplished. Finally, to support the mighty 8th Air Force Heritage Museum near Savannah, Georgia. The 303rd's own Lou Lyle was the dedicated and driving force behind the establishing of this living memorial. But that alone is not my rationale for making this one of the primary things I would hope to accomplish. The Heritage Museum is, in fact, the foremost repository in the world for the artists and monuments which reflect most dramatically the proud record of the 303rd and its personnel in the service of our country. I believe it is incumbent upon every one of us to do what we can to assist the museum in achieving its goals, which after all, in many respects, are our own goals. I have a great team to work with in the coming year. I am particularly pleased that Hal Sussman has joined the Executive Committee of the Board of Directors as Vice President for Administration. I, I can understand why Hal made the decision to run for and take the office of Vice President for Administration. The VP admin supervises the newsletter. <laughs> as if anybody could ever supervise him. <laughs> Ed Miller, thanks for your dedicated service as the outgoing president. Ladies and gentlemen of the 303, thank you for your trust. I make this solemn pledge. I will never let you down. Our annual reunions in cities all over the U.S. are always grand affairs. Whether it's riding the rapids on the Payette River in Colorado, or trying for a low score on a golf course in Pittsburgh, or visiting a museum in Portland, Oregon, 
are conducting a memorial service in the U.S. Air Force Academy Chapel at Colorado Springs, presenting awards to the most deserving leaders of the association in Savannah and in Dayton, or just plain relaxing with my wife, a double martini and a good cigar. We even gathered in reunion one year at our World War II air base in Molesworth, England, where we dedicated a memorial to the 303rd Bomb Group. I'm now in my eighth year as editor of our quarterly Hells Angels newsletter. The 303rd Bomb Group Association has honored me over the years, and of course I'm grateful, but everything I've done has really and truly been a labor of love. So, in retirement, my wife and I are both actively and constantly engaged, although our golf game has deteriorated to the point where it is now cruel and inhuman punishment. Mary Lee is an ardent and dedicated gardener and in competition She's also a member of a local antique doll club and plays bridge about once a month. Pretty good for a girl who spent much of her earlier years on a farm near Spokane, Washington. I've also been active in the Foreign Service Retirees Association of Florida. That's the largest state chapter in the country with a membership of 700. I was elected chairman in 1997 and served in that capacity for almost three years. When I completed my term in office, there was a commendation from the Board of Advisors. It gave me great pleasure in 1998 to present an association award to Thomas Pickering, my ambassador in Nigeria and also he was the former U.S. representative at the United Nations. My goal was and is to raise the level of the association from social club to active participant in educating our public about how our diplomats abroad serve America. The commendation reads, The Foreign Service Retirees Association of Florida Men and women who have served across the world to protect, preserve, and advance United States interests in the crucial realm of foreign affairs express their appreciation and commendation to Eddie Deerfield for the outstanding and inspiring leadership which he has provided as president of our organization. It's a good feeling to look back on a lifetime of associations with so many people's in so many diverse cultures. I feel a particular affection for the men of the 303rd Bombardment Group with whom I served at Molesworth Air Base in England during the air war against Nazi Germany. It's a feeling only those who have shared the dangers and hardships of war can really understand. Thanks for taking the time to hear my story, now it's time to light a good cigar and enjoy a martini before dinner, stirred, not shaken. Mary Lee is cooking an Indian Kima curry tonight, hot and spicy, one of our favorite dishes. <laughs>